Welcome everyone to the Project Highlight Tracks presentation for the Callaway County Build Grant, Improving US 641 from the Tennessee State Line to the Clarks River Bridge. I'm John Meyer with HMB Professional Engineers and I wanna thank you for uh, attending this session today. Presenting for us today, we have Chris Kuntz from KYTC District 1, Gary Sharp from Palmer Engineering, David Waldner from Palmer Engineering, and Keith McDonald from Palmer Engineering. And without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Chris to begin the presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank whoever from uh, KYTC managed to find that picture of me with a mask on on Facebook. That was a nice touch. Um, this project is the uh, US 641 Callaway County uh, Bill Grant project. Um, the project uh, is constructing a new four-lane highway uh, from the city of Murray south of the Tennessee state line near Hazel. Uh, presenting today, as uh, John mentioned, here's the four presenters. I'm going to start off and then we'll hand off to each other uh, with the different areas as this project, as this presentation moves along. Um, I'm going to start off with the project background and project overview. Uh, this project um, goes back to an original 2002 alternatives planning study uh, when this project first came into the six-year plan. Uh, we did a, a planning study with some public involvement that recommended building a new four-lane highway uh, to the west of the existing US 641 from, from Murray to, to Hazel that would then tie into a, a project that TDOT had in their design phase at the time. In 2011, we received some funding for preliminary engineering and design and selected Palmer Engineering for the project. Uh, not long after we selected Palmer, the project uh, lost funding in the six year plan and, and kind of languished for about six years. Uh, the, the project does have a pretty high um, accident rate, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But due to that, that high accident rate, kind of key two things happening in the 2017 through 2018 timeframe. In 2017, um, it, we uh, started a $1.4 million roadway departure HSIP project that did some spot improvements along the southern end of the corridor. And the project also uh, scored very high in shift. That was the first year we did the shift program. The project scored very well and um, was actually, I think, the second highest scoring shift project in District 1. So it came back into the six-year plan and we restarted with preliminary engineering and environmental assessment. That time we brought Palmer Engineering on board to do the environmental assessment work. Uh, and in 2018, around the time we started that work, we were approached by the city of Murray and Callaway County about um, combining together, leveraging all three organizations to apply for a build grant for the project. Uh, Callaway County was actually the applicant for the build grant. And in um, 2018, we uh, we were notified that the project did win um, a 20 with a possible max grant of 25 million. We won a $23 million grant for the project. Uh, for those, uh, I think most people in the cabinet and consultant world are, are aware now of what the the build grant um, program is. This used to be called the Tiger Grant program in a previous iteration. And so in the process of applying for the build grant, we had already started preliminary engineering in February of 18, started environmental studies and uh, environmental assessment work in August of 18. And then in a, uh, December of 2018 was when we were notified of the build grant um, award. So we already had a little bit of work towards engineering and towards NEPA document, NEPA, NEPA approval, but uh, it still put us on a pretty tight timeline for the project. Um, as, as Gary and others will, will mention later, um, we were awarded the build grant in December 2018 with a deadline of having the project to construction by the end of September of 2020. And so for all of the things we had to do with uh, design, environmental and right of way utilities put a pretty uh, tight timeline on the project. 
a uh, little bit more about the the build grant. Um, the the last round of build grants did put a uh, some some money set aside for uh, projects in rural areas, and and that helped this project win. Um, the city of Murray and and Callaway County each put half a million dollars into the project. So le leveraging those local funds was a was a pretty big driver also in this project scoring high through that build grant project. Uh, the existing conditions, we have uh, the average daily traffic ranges from somewhere between 5,900 to 7,300 vehicles a day with a truck percentage of nine to 10, nine to 12%. We do have a kind of a high history of crashes on this project, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, one thing a lot of you will probably notice is that based on the ADT, um, this you know doesn't necessarily warrant a new four lane road corridor. And we had worked and talked to the city and the county and explained to them that with the traffic they had and the financial issues the state was having that we would be looking at only designing and building a new two lane road or possibly improving the two lanes that we already had. Uh, that was not a very, that was not received very well by the locals. And that was part of why they wanted to um, go after the build grant. So as part of our build grant agreement with the city and the county, we agreed that uh, if the project won the build grant, we would use that $23 million towards uh, committing to building a new four lane facility. And Luckily for us at the cabinet, we we were won we won the grant. We're able to make that commitment. Um, otherwise, we would have we would have had some some battles on our hands with the locals uh, over the two lane versus four lane issue. Uh, there's some I know you can't probably read this slide, but the uh, uh, the crash history we have three times the statewide average of, of fatalities and incapacitating injuries over the last ten years. And that drove us um, towards being able to get the little bit of money we did from HSIP and also for scoring the project fairly high through the shift program and the build grant process. Uh, preliminary engineering, uh, we had a, I'm going to turn this over to Gary to go through the preliminary engineering phases. But, you know, as I mentioned, the tight timelines we had, we we awarded the build grant in December of 18 and, and we're already moved to a PLNG meeting in February of 19 uh, with our, our alternative development that Gary and Dave Walner will discuss later. And we had a, a very well attended public meeting in March of, of 2019. So both of those items were able to move along pretty quickly after we were awarded the build grant. Now, Gary, I'm going to turn this off and turn this over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. And, and also let me say thank you to the uh, ACEC and uh, FHWA and Transportation Cabinet for, for hosting this uh, virtual partnering conference. I, I sat in on all the sessions yesterday and it was uh, it was definitely different, but it was a lot of fun and, and a really, really successful. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, I'm going to move on, talk about preliminary engineering. The, the project's broken into two project segments. The northern project and nor northern portion runs from the Tennessee Kentucky state line to the Clark River Bridge. And that ties into another project that's under construction now from the Clark River Bridge up into, into Murray. Uh, this particular, the northern portion of the project is the segment of the project that's subject to the bill grant funding plus the uh, additional funding by, from KTC and, the, and federal funding. The Southern tie is funded by TDOT per a bi-state agreement. And uh, in addition to just the geometric tie, uh, logic will terminize what took us south of the border as well. Uh, there's an existing uh, environmental document running from coming from Paris, Tennessee up to near uh, Crossland Road uh, in, in south of the, of the Tennessee state line. And that was identified as, as a logical termini in consultation with the uh, FHWA in Tennessee and Kentucky with the idea that we would tie those two environmental documents together. And Dave Walner will talk more about that, but that's uh, that kind of gives you, you, you won't hear much about Tennessee in this, from the, the design standpoint in this presentation, but David will uh, talk about the uh, both the Northern project and the Southern tie and his uh, discussion of the expedited environmental process. Uh, we, in terms of alternatives that were considered, uh, 
we looked at, at alternatives along the existing uh, US 641 corridor. Uh, we studied very briefly the, the concept of a five lane alternative along the existing corridor, but abandoned that very early on because of the uh, significant utility impacts and the, uh, and the property damage impacts. So essentially uh, th those alternatives that really move forward along the existing corridor were all three lane alternatives. Uh, the alternatives on the west and east side of the existing uh, US 641 were four lane alternatives consistent with what Chris had talked about earlier in, in terms of the, uh, the local expectations. And here you can see the blue, we, we use colors uh, to describe our alternatives. The blue alternative was along the existing uh, 641 corridor. You can see from the schematic that it's a, a typical three lane section, uh, one, uh, two lanes, one in each direction with a two way center turn lane uh, throughout. And we pretty much with, this, with the blue alternative worked along the existing alignment uh, cleaning up, straightening out some uh, horizontal and vertical curvature, but essentially we stayed as true to the existing alignment as we could. Uh, also in regard to the blue alternative, there is a segment of the, uh, in the community of Hazel that has been identified as uh, eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And where that we had to pass through that, alter uh, that uh, area, we used a two lane alternative uh, with, uh, with parking on either side uh, which was essentially matched the footprint that was existing so that we didn't encroach on the historic district. The, the uh, green alternative was to the west, and it was identified during the preliminary line and grade uh, phase as preliminarily preferred. You can see from the schematic that, uh, uh, that it's a, a four-lane divided roadway, 40-foot uh, depressed median, uh, excuse me, it's a, I think it's a, a wider, 48-foot a depressed median. Uh, with a uh, uh, four lanes, and you will see from the, and I know it's hard to see in the, 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 in the uh, graphic, but uh, we've got two variations of the uh, green alternative, one being uh, the solid green uh, uh, alternative, which was preliminarily preferred. There's also a uh, dash line that was, a, uh, uh, that was studied, and that was studied primarily, you know, we're going through some, some very nice farmland, and we were looking at options to minimize the, the uh, uh, farms that were split and, and, and the damage to the farmland. So we weren't too terribly successful with avoiding splitting the farms, but we did look at these two options at those at the at that location to to address that concern. The orange alternative was uh, uh, on the east side of the existing US 641. Uh, again, same typical section. Uh, it worked along the uh, existing alignment. Uh, the one issue I would point out with the orange alternative is it is it does have a railroad crossing in Kentucky, whereas on the green alternatives, the railroad crossing was in Tennessee. We did have a public, as Chris mentioned, we had a public meeting in March of 2019. Uh, that public meeting was very well attended. We had 288 people sign in. We actually had more than that, that, that number of people attend. Uh, uh, we had people lined up all the way much far out the, out the doors waiting to get in. And some folks finally just uh, kind of, uh, they would uh, push by the people waiting to sign in and came on in. Uh, so we probably, we had more than 288 people, but we did have 288 signed in. We had 163 people complete questionnaires. Their expectations for the project was to improve safety, increase capacity. And even though that there's very, relatively low traffic in, in context of a four lane roadway. There were some that still believed that uh, commented that relieving congestion was a, was a consider a primary consideration. And of course, economic development was another consideration. Uh, in terms of the alternatives that were, uh, that were uh, considered, there was an overwhelming preference for alternative 4A, the green alternative with, with 47% of those responding to the questionnaire <laughs> indicating a preference for that alternative. Uh, and no more than 20% of the people responding preferred a, a, another, uh, another alternative. I'm going to turn it over to David Walner at this time and let him talk about the uh, uh, expedited environmental process. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, appreciate it. With, uh, when you, we're doing presentations like this, uh, an old speaker's trick I always heard was to picture your audience in, in their underwear if you were nervous. Uh, 
Uh, I'm a little bit leery of doing that because with this virtual platform, that may actually be the case with some folks, I'm not sure. Um, but just like this project, time is of the essence, so I'll jump right in. Uh, we'll start off, I've got a spoiler alert. We're going to widen the road, uh, but the road isn't being widened due to any capacity concern. Uh, the justification for the improvements here are uh, related to the high fatality rate that uh, has been seen in the project corridor. Uh, Gary mentioned the 2002 planning study. Uh, one of the conclusions that that study reached was that alternatives uh, should be uh, looked at to the west, off corridor alternatives should be looked at to the west, to the east. There are a lot of floodplains, streams, and wetlands that they uh, thought would create constructability issues and concerns. So uh, when the project kind of restarted in 2012, uh, there was some preliminary design done and a couple of alternatives were uh, developed along that western side uh, as shown here, the red and blue alternatives. Now, a couple of things I wanna point out about these is uh, now our orientation north is to your right. So um, north of Hazel, along to the right of your screen, you'll see a connector between the, uh, the alternatives, the off-quarter alternatives and the existing alignment. Uh, that was being made across uh, a residential street, E.W. Miller Street, and uh, that was gonna be improved with uh, T intersections on, on each end. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is the unusual geometry that you see at the, uh, to the left of the screen at the southern end of the project. Uh, that is necessitated by a railroad that lies immediately adjacent to the, um, to the project corridor, to the existing US uh, 641. So the alternatives on the west side were having to get up over this railroad in order to tie back into the existing alignment. So we really began working uh, on the project uh, environmentally in August of 2018. Uh, we pressed a historic property review early in the process to make sure we didn't have any fatal flaws. Uh, about 340 uh, properties were surveyed as a part of that work. Uh, we found there were historic properties sprinkled along the existing corridor. We figured there would be some of those uh, the downtown historic or downtown Hazel uh, had a historic district, which wasn't really a surprise to us. Uh, what was a surprise was about in right in the middle of the project, there were two large farmsteads that were determined to be historic that uh, the preliminary off quarter alignments bisected. So uh, the designers began evaluating avoidance and minimization alternatives. Uh, pushing those alternatives further to the west uh, to get around those properties. Uh, when that occurred, uh, given the extra length and the cost that would be associated with, uh, with doing an alternative further to the west, it was decided that we also needed to take a look at an alternative to the east as well. It was about at this same time that the build grant was approved. And uh, so this was in uh, December of 2018. And as Chris mentioned, it demanded that the project be let by no later than September of 2020. So uh, at that time, environmentally, with the exception of the work that we'd done along the existing corridor, uh, with all of our off-corridor alignments, we were essentially uh, starting over. But with $23 million on the line, it wasn't a question of if, it was just a question of how. So uh, we, along with the, the design uh, function, began to put together a schedule that would allow us to meet that uh, letting date of September of 2020. Working backwards from the uh, construction letting date, a couple of key things emerged that we needed to accomplish. One is we needed a preliminary preferred alternative by uh, late February in order to get the right-of-way process started as early as possible. 
Uh, secondly, we needed the uh, environmental process complete by no later than uh, the October to November timeframe so that uh, the right of way process would have time to deal with condemnations if those became necessary. So once those uh, points were set for us, we filled in the gaps and our, our schedule required us to have a draft EA by uh, no later than the first week or so of June uh, with the completion of the environmental process in October. Uh, so we had about 10 months, essentially, uh, to get through the entire process. So uh, Gary talked about these, and I won't uh, talk about them too much more, uh, but I'll just point out that at the time of this reset, uh, we, the work that we did on the red and blue alternatives uh, that those corresponded with the northern and southern ends of the new alternative four, the green alternative. So we've done a little bit of work there. We've done uh, the work we've done along the existing corridor. Uh, that was all still uh, germane to where we were, uh, but nothing had been done on that alternative to the east that was uh, now alternative five. Since we needed a preferred alternative by sometime in February, uh, that meant we needed to go out and do all the field work on these off-corridor alignments uh, before then so that the, we had information to provide the project team uh, at a preliminary line and grade meeting. So it was a great time of year to be doing our, our environmental field work. Uh, so the preliminary line and grade meeting was held uh, in late February. And as Gary mentioned, uh, alternative 4A was identified as the preferred alternative in Kentucky. Now, at this time, TDOT was very uncommitted as to exactly what uh, they were going to do with the project. Uh, they weren't sure where they wanted it to tie down. They weren't sure what typical section they wanted to use. Uh, primarily, they were focused on either a three or a five lane alternative. Uh, and they weren't sure about when they were going to be able to uh, advance it to right of way and construction. So all of those uh, questions still being up in the air, we took uh, the alternatives to the public at a public meeting on March the 12th. And at that meeting identified for the public uh, that this was the preliminary identified preferred alternative in Kentucky. Uh, Gary mentioned the public support there was for that alternative. Although I will mention that there was uh, a little bit of concern raised about uh, where we were tying in on this particular drawing uh, for 4A, where we were tying in on the southern end of the project. So with the support of the public uh, behind the preliminary preferred alternative, uh, we meet, moved full steam ahead with the Kentucky portion of the project. Uh, we. Uh, put together a memo for Chris that identified the environmental impacts of the preferred alternative uh, that he could use to secure uh, state funding of early right-of-way acquisition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that was key to the schedule. Uh, with only three months of turnaround between when the EA was to be approved and when the FONSI was to be approved, uh, that did not afford us enough time to wait and do phase one archeology span uh, during that period. So we went ahead and initiated getting that phase one work uh, underway. Uh, we also uh, initiated the work on the biological assessment for the project and uh, on the permits that would be needed uh, from the uh, Division of Water and the Corps. Uh, during this period, so I'm talking about between March and when the EA was uh, done in June, uh, we also began to put together uh, some of the sections that wouldn't necessarily be affected by these uncertainties that were uh, going on with the Tennessee part of the work. So the purpose and need, air quality, uh, sections such as that, we went ahead and began to prepare drafts and circulated those to the, the state and the federal agencies uh, for their review while uh, some of these decisions with TDOT uh, began to be made. So the TDOT decision-making then was uh, clearly on the critical path 
uh, for us being able to uh, achieve our objective of getting the EA finished in early June. Uh, for several weeks, it seemed that there would be no end to the number of concepts that TDOT uh, designers conceived for making this tie-in. So they were, weren't sure where they wanted it to tie in, what, weren't sure what the typical section uh, they wanted to use. Uh, and to the credit of the Palmer design team, uh, each of these concepts, there was some preliminary engineering done on it, cost estimates prepared, and uh, we also looked at the environmental uh, differences uh, among these alternatives uh, so that that decision making could be informed. The uh, Several of the alternatives uh, I thought were uh, very unusual uh, for a road with the, the traffic on it that Chris talked about earlier. One of the things they asked us to look at was uh, building an interchange. Um, secondly, I mentioned the railroad. One of the alternatives they asked us to look at was to uh, elevate the railroad, which required about uh, a mile of railroad reconstruction in order to elevate the railroad and create an underpass situation for the new road. And uh, then another was uh, there, there is an existing, Gary mentioned Crossland Road. Uh, they mentioned that we could just tie into that with a T intersection and allow people then to uh, use that to cross over the railroad or to go across the railroad to the existing, uh, existing road. So Eventually, TDOT made a decision. They selected alternative 4I, which is the, the longest of the alternatives. Uh, that occurred on April 30th, uh, just five weeks before uh, we were scheduled to have the, the draft EA put together. So in the, the last few weeks before the uh, EA was finished, uh, with TDOT's uncertainty about scheduling, uh, their part of the work, the connection between the preferred alternative and existing 641 uh, was something that was began to be questioned. Uh, the T intersections that uh, you see on the uh, figure to the left on your screen, that is what had been designed. Uh, KYTC asked us to take a look at creating a free flow intersection or, or free, yes, a free flowing intersection, one that would allow traffic to move from the preferred over to uh, existing 641 uh, without stopping. Um, as part of that, they also ask us to evaluate uh, not only uh, that connection being made along E.W. Miller, which I mentioned, but also uh, to look at an off corridor type of approach, which uh, got into some additional right of way that uh, we hadn't anticipated up to that point and uh, really made Keith McDonald happy. So, uh, with that, these alternatives had never been presented to the, the public. So the EA uh, identified alternative 4A as, and 4I as the preferred along the uh, new corridor, and, but it did not identify which of three, these three concepts was preferred. Uh, that didn't occur until after uh, public involvement uh, with the hearing. So we pushed our way across the finish line, got the EA submitted in early June. Uh, we, uh, the EA was approved on July 17th. Uh, we held a hearing August 22nd and the FONSI was approved identifying the E.W. Miller connection uh, along the, uh, on the off corridor connection as uh, part of the selected alternative. So I think uh, most of you are probably familiar with, uh, with this picture, the Iron Triangle. Uh, the, with the Bill Grant awarded schedule drove much of the project decision making and time was at a premium. Environmental reviews had to occur as the alternatives were being conceived and preliminarily developed. The time between when some of these concepts were uh, being conceived and uh, when we needed to be out doing field work, work was typically only a week to 10 days, somewhere in that range. So we had to go to the field with very, very preliminary engineering um, for our center lines uh, and uh, just try to take a broad brush, a stroke, 
broad brush approach to identifying what environmental impacts uh, there might be. Uh, I point this out only because when you're working with a project where schedule is so important, uh, as a project manager, you can't really pinch pennies. You can't be worried about having to make an additional trip to the project site uh, with this. We did have to do that several times uh, because of changes that would occur. And we'd have to make sure that uh, minor changes that were, cha that were occurring weren't creating uh, critical issues or uh, fatal flaws in the, in the design. You always want to work smart uh, with a project like this. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we had some silver bullet that uh, we identified to get this project done, but that wasn't really the case. Uh, what I've said about this project is that it was less about innovation than it was about perspiration. Uh, just making sure we uh, put the resources to it and committed the time necessary to meet the goal. Uh, communication uh, was critical, can't overemphasize that. We held regular meetings with um, TDOT, KYTC, the design staff, uh, all to make sure that we understood what decisions were being made and what information was needed to make the next decision and that everyone understood uh, where we were on the project. Uh, that was important for us making sure we initiated uh, environmental studies at the most appropriate time, especially for things like phase one archeology. span And with environmental evaluations, occurring as the alternatives are being developed, uh, sometimes while you're in the field and being developed back in the office, uh, we had to be flexible, we had to adapt to change. Um, and that was just a matter, we needed to embrace what we were doing, manage what we were doing, enjoy the process, um, but not let it manage us. A couple of other points that I'll make uh, with regard to project management when uh, schedule is uh, this demanding, uh, there's a heavy responsibility on the uh, project manager, both at the environmental side and for the uh, project as a whole. Uh, you have to manage this project, a project like this every day. If you skip a day or two, that turns into uh, weeks of delay in the meeting your schedule. Uh, you also have to be careful that you're not assuming that people know what they're supposed to do uh, and uh, assume that as little as possible because if uh, if you assume that and that's not the case, that can be a schedule killer. Um, you have to understand other states' processes. Uh, issues such as deferring archaeology, uh, developing MOAs and getting them signed, things of that sort uh, are very different from state to state and in some cases take much longer than what we're accustomed to. So uh, you need to be aware of what those uh, differences are so that that can be included in your schedule. Uh, speaking of schedule, uh, critical path scheduling uh, has to be consistently monitored and time consuming processes initiated as early as possible. Uh, one thing it's not always possible to do and sometimes difficult to do, but uh, you have to make decisions and, and press forward. Uh, always be forward leaning. Uh, you can't be, you can't second guess yourself too much and looking over your shoulder uh, there's just no time for hand wringing and backtracking. And finally, perhaps the most important of uh, all the things that are, were critical to getting this project across the finish line was everyone pulling in the same direction uh, and having a, the same level of commitment to meet that goal. Uh, this was evidenced in the environmental process by base studies being reviewed and approved in a matter of uh, sometimes days, but often no more than uh, weeks, as opposed to more typically weeks or, or months. So uh, that's what we did to uh, try to set up the uh, right-of-way process so that they could be successful in getting their part of the project complete. I'm going to turn it over to Keith McDonald and, and let him tell you a little bit about how they managed that process. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, one thing that made our job a little easier was having design, environmental, and the right-of-way staff being all in the, with the same firm, Palmer Engineering. Uh, we were able to get questions answered and plan issues were handled in a, in a timely manner, most being taken care of the same day.
uh, if not the same day, then at least later on that week. There is one note I need to give all of y'all watching. Uh, I may not follow my slides uh, during my presentation the way I should. I may be dropping around, jumping around a wee bit. But for all those that want to come to Winchester, I do have drink tickets for tonight. Uh, as everyone said, uh, we got our preliminary uh, preferred alignment in, in March. And doing that in, and then getting the pre-authorization of, of right-of-way done, we ordered titles in uh, April of 2019. We used Darren Embry and his firm. Uh, we probably got more titles than we needed, but it was better to have titles that we ne didn't need uh, than need additional titles uh, and have to wait for them. Another plan to do during this was to assemble a team. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to work quickly based on the deadlines that were set to have the project cleared. Uh, we had approximately from the time mostly finished right-of-way plans were done, we were going to have about nine months to either sign or sue everyone. And that included all the appraisal work and everything like that. So in April, we also uh, decided to set up our uh, Palmer uh, right-of-way team. We hired three appraisers, Leanne Parkinson, Steve Riley, and Rodney Williams. Uh, we had Tim Flynn as one of our staff agents. We hired Lori Keith and Ralph Raymond as other acquisition agents. And then we got uh, John Bancroft and... Uh, Kevin Ham on board as our relocation agents. Uh, in May of 2019, we had a scoping meeting. Uh, we knew that the teamwork was going to be to, uh, was going to be split up, or the project was going to be split up between uh, uh, the district and uh, our firm and getting the project cleared. Uh, in May, we also started assigning uh, the appraisers to parcels. That way they could begin work on one shared comparable sales book for the project to where all three appraisers were using the same comp book and uh, not changing it around. They knew uh, that way there was consistency throughout the project and they began working on that in May, and we got finalized uh, stage one right away plans in June. And then in July, I met with the appraisers and we sat down and, and prioritized all the parcels. Uh, we moved to the relocation parcels first, and then uh, moved on to our more complex, and we started assigning uh, parcels to the agents that I was in charge of in July also. In August, uh, the relocation people started uh, working on the acquisition stage relocation report and getting that ready to take place. Uh, we also sent uh, our draft deeds to Heather DeBerry and uh, Jeremy Reed, who are the uh, the boss and the district attorney and the legal staff for uh, district one, they did all our reviews of the titles and the deeds and, and got approvals back on those. In September, we were started receiving our uh, appraisals in on our relocation parcels. Uh, for this project, uh, we had 57 parcels, 39 of them were were appraisal parcels. 18 were going to be uh, MARs. We had 28 relocations to, to be involved with this. Uh, then we were moving along pretty well. And in September, we had, a, as David said, uh, a major plan change. E.W. Miller uh, was redesigned. Uh, this plan change was had parcels deleted existing parcels changing areas and requiring relocation, and then parcels added. Uh, 
with some additional relocations. Uh, Greg and I worked together on this to uh, split up the parcels and and continue to, to work because our thoughts on this project were sort of like Ricky Bobby's. If we weren't uh, if we weren't first getting to letting, we were we're last, and we're going to get to letting. Uh, and we were able to start making our offers on the right of way projects. Uh, the district staff also started making the offers. Uh, Francie and Kim and Zach worked very hard. Uh, we had two KYTC review appraisers, uh, Chuck Watkins and Roger Crew, who were invaluable to working with our appraisers to get everything done. Uh, from November until uh, February 1st, when we made our last offer, we continued making offers and uh, completing the relocations. Then this fun little thing in March hit called a pande pandemic, and it sort of slowed everything down. Uh, we delivered our last acquisition check in uh, April. We completed all, all of our relocations in June, but we turned in most all our suits between January and March. And there were only eight suits that were turned in, but that's when the court systems began shutting down. And my hat goes off to Jeremy and Heather, and then really the whole appraisal acquisition of relocation team and KYTC's uh, central office staff uh, because without their hard work and getting things processed through for us, we could not get a, this project completed. Uh, our main thing was to keep coordination, to keep the project moving to the letting. And we kept a live communication open always, first with monthly meetings, then bi-weekly meetings, and then weekly meetings. And yes, there was some kicking and screaming in our meetings, but we always worked our way through it. <coughs> we had to be oops, adaptable. And one thing we had to do was always endeavor to persevere to keep our project on track. Now we'll turn it over to Gary for him to finish up with the final design. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Keith. And uh, are, how many of those drink tickets are for me? None. You're on the wagon. Okay. All right. Just want to check. I'm going to try to finish it up for us uh, and uh, carry us on to the end. Uh, uh, I want to talk about final, de final design and plan development. Uh, when we scoped the project, in addition to a PLNG meeting, we included additional meetings uh, for 50% uh, for plans, 85% uh, plans, and, and then final joint inspection. And at that time, we thought, well, maybe that, what, what will we have to talk about when we get to, uh, to joint inspection? Well, as it turned out, we had plenty to talk about, but uh, uh, with the 50% plan review meetings, what we wanted to do is, again, make sure that as, as plan, we knew that plans would be evolving uh, with the right-of-way process, so we wanted to make sure we were addressing that through the, uh, during a, for right-of-way purposes, but we also wanted to use the 50% plan review meeting to talk about some, some of the unique aspects of the project. And the cabinet had talked with us uh, early on, uh, well, at or about, at, at or about the uh, uh, PL and G phase, about adding our cuts at three locations, at Tom Taylor Trail, at Midway Road, and at Phillips Lane. And this wasn't so much to address uh, the uh, uh, crash con concerns for crashes at the particular at that at the at the beginning of the project but for concern for what might evolve as the pro as, as the project uh, as development occurred along the project court and the new project corridor so we used our 50 percent review meeting that was really the first time that the cabinet had an opportunity to review those uh, our cut concepts we also you'd heard from david walner and keith about the uh, options for connectivity to Hazel, the Hazel connector being either improving a E.W. Miller with a T intersection with a uh, E.W. Miller, a free flowing connection or with a, 
a new alignment off corridor, I mean, uh, uh, north of E.W. Miller that was also free flowing. So we used, again, our 50% review meeting was intended to address those concerns. And one of the things that you have not heard about thus far would be utilities. And essentially with this project being a, a cross country type project, we really don't have a lot of utility impacts, uh, you know, mostly service lines, et cetera, with the exception of a little gas line. Uh, Trans Canada Gas has a, a three tra a high pressure transmission lines that we're impacting, uh, two 30 inch lines and one 36 inch line. And our main line is crossing that gas line, those lines at a, a rather significant skew. And then we're also touching it with two of our, uh, where we tie our approaches down. But we had started working with TransCanada early in the project process. And you know, our big concern was whether or not we could have, uh, was encasement of those lines. So in working with TransCanada, we were working toward an agreement that, that they were, if we could have our grades develop such that we would pr maintain a minimum of seven feet of cover over the gas line uh, for the driving lanes over the gas lines at all times, they were uh, agreeable to not having to do an encasement. They also asked us to build a, a, a concrete cap uh, three feet over the gas lines or essentially a concrete land bridge. So those were the kind of the highlights of what we talked about it at the 50% re review meeting. We also talked about MOT and a lot of the, the things, just to, to, uh, a lot of the other project elements, but these were kind of highlights. We also at the same time were working with uh, TDOT to uh, develop a bi-state agreement that that bi-state agreement uh, dealt with uh, with funding uh, for construction and, and design in Tennessee. Uh, what was what ha trying to get you know work what, with Tennessee to see what they would pay for. It also dealt with some of the the uh, environmental documentation and, and uh, logical termini issues that uh, that David's already talked about. Ultimately, the uh, bi-state agreement was finalized and it was signed in October two thousand nineteen. Uh, we had a public hearing in August of uh, uh, 20, August 22nd, 2019. Now, the objectives of that public hearing were, uh, again, typical with any public hearing. We were, one, going to provide the uh, public with just an update on project status. We were going to describe those alternatives that were currently still being considered uh, and including uh, the preferred alternative, uh, describe the results of the environmental document uh, assessment. And then we also, since the public had never seen any of the options for the long-term connector at Hazel, we were going to present those options for, for the public's uh, review and comment. And then finally, we would provide the uh, public with an opportunity to uh, comment on alternatives and to hear and record public statements. The, uh, the public hearing was not quite as well attended as the uh, public meeting. Uh, that particular day, it was a rainy day, uh, thunderstorms in the area, uh, we had 105 people sign in, uh, but surprisingly, we only had 29 people com complete questionnaires, and I think we only had five people make public uh, make public statements. Uh, in the question from the from the public statements and from the questionnaires, we determined that there was a little more opposition to the preferred alternative 4A than initially was uh, manifested at the public meeting. Uh, but as David mentioned about not going back and second guessing yourself, uh, after the public uh, after the public hearing, uh, we met with the cabinet and we worked our way through all the comments and discussed all of those, and ultimately decided that we would continue forward with the uh, uh, identified preferred alternative 4A. Uh, and in regard to the free flowing intersections at the Hazel connector, uh, uh, that was uh, the the public expressed a, a preference for a free flowing intersection, not a T intersection. And then there also was a preference for that connector being off uh, on new alignment, uh, somewhat north of the E.W. Miller Street uh, a road. Uh, E.W. Miller Street, if it's in the city limits of Hazel, it's E.W. Miller Road if it's in the county. And in this case, we were right on the uh, city on the county city county line. Now moving on to eighty five percent, the eighty five percent review uh, meeting that we had. Uh, uh, one of the things that I also mentioned that uh, when Chris meant, talked about the uh, the initial preliminary engineering work that was done in 2011, uh, I'd also point out that we had a, a a value engineering study that was done in 2012 that really looked at the preliminary uh, in alignments at that time. However, as you as you've seen and heard, uh, 
this project's been stopped and started and restarted several times. So uh, in November of 2019, uh, we went, uh, uh, we did another value engineering study uh, on, uh, at this time would be about what I would think 70, 75% uh, complete the construction plans. Uh, we basically gave the value engineering, we, uh, we drew a line in the sand and uh, uh, two weeks before the VE study was going to begin, we just said, we're going to give you the VE team, what we have at this at this point in time. And it was about 70, 75 percent complete at that time. Uh, so they went through a, a VE study in, in, in November. We had recommendations back to us in December. And uh, then we had worked through a number of those recommendations. And then uh, but at the 85 percent review meeting, that's when we brought that back to the project team and uh, to, and, and with our recommendations about which of those uh, rec uh, those VE recommendations could, would be implemented and how. We also used that same meeting to do final reviews of the R cuts and, at, at Tom Tedder Trail and Midway Road and Phillips Lane. We also, again, used that same meeting to, uh, to for final vetting of the uh, design for the Hazel connector along the uh, new alignment, the free-flowing intersection. And we continued to uh, bring everybody up to speed on how our negotiations or, uh, or deliberations were, were going with the uh, Trans Canada Gas or TC Energy was the uh, entity we actually were working with. Now, when we initially envisioned the final inspection in June or in final inspection for the project, we th we asked ourselves the question: Well, with all these other meetings, what will we have to talk about? But as Keith mentioned, uh, we had that uh, that uh, 85% review meeting in February of 2020. And as you all know, March of 2020 is when everything started to shut down and we were uh, still in the middle of a right of way acquisition. And Keith and his folks were really, they were really busting it to try to get, uh, get, get right away cleared. But we had about 20 acres of, uh, and, and some key parcels on the North end of the project and right of, negotiations were just, they were just stalled. Uh, and one the the property, a couple of the property owners came forward. Uh, one property owner in particular came forward with a, a, a request that for us to consider a design change. And that uh, request for design change involved shifting the approach for tying existing US 641 to the proposed. It also it ultimately involved some changes in uh, lengthening of a channel change and relocation of a channel change. It also involved the revising a bridge location and uh, the design of the bridge to include a turn lane. Uh, and it, interestingly enough, that, that was an alternative that's something that not necessarily exactly what the, the landowner had asked us to consider, but it was something that we had looked at early on. So we had some familiar, familiarity with, with what was being requested. And we, so we got, got, got busy and, and, and went, went through some very detailed analyses and ultimately came up to, came to the conclusion that we could make a design change, provided that the property owner would provide us with right of entry to, the, to those key parcels. Uh, again, a little over 20 acres. Uh, it actually, the, 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 we felt like that the, the added cost for the channel change would be offset with what we might have to deal with, with potentially losing the, if, if we couldn't get a schedule, uh, some schedule relief, uh, losing the $23 million bill grant, that was a primary concern. Uh, we also were dealing with some HECRAS issues uh, with the bridge. Uh, in, the, in the current location, it had, we had what's called a pressure flow uh, con condition. And by relocating the bridge uh, by some 800 feet, we were able to avoid that pressure fl flow condition. So there were some wins and, lose, wins and losses on either side. But the offshoot of the whole thing was we ended up, uh, we made those changes and the property owner agreed to provide us right of entry. Uh, and we didn't have to go to court with, with for any parcel. So it was a win-win uh, for everyone. We also uh, uh, were concluding our negotiations with the uh, TC Energy uh, in regard to the gas line uh, uh, issue. Uh, one of the things that TC Energy had been uh, asking us to do is they wanted us to include subsurface utility excavation uh, at various phases in the project construction so that they could inspect the, the uh, pipelines to make sure that there was no uh, issues or damages during uh, associated with the construction process. Uh, 
that was really problematic from a design standpoint about how to how to incorporate those those activities into the plans. So one of the things that we did is we worked with those guys and they agreed to let us do the subsurface utility excavation during the design phase to to expose the the pipes, uh, let them do do what level of inspection they wanted, and then we installed uh, uh, some pipeline inspection tubes, really? uh, PVC pipes. Uh, that we used uh, to inspect the uh, the pipelines, and in that uh, we uh, uh, we were able to get that moved off dead center. Also, now, moving forward, uh, we completed submitted final plans in uh, in uh, August of 2020. Uh, the PS and E package was submitted to FHWA in uh, uh, in August. It was approved in September, and we're on pace for an October letting. Uh, we're working on performance measures. Uh, uh, that'll be carried through from initial measures in 2020 uh, through 2020.